I'd like to thank the organizers uh, of this expert meeting, uh, the UNECE, and particularly the FAO and Dr. Francesco Tubiello uh, for uh, working with us and uh, inviting me to give this presentation. I'm going to give a brief overview of the global surface temperature monitoring uh, that's done at NASA GIS um, with, the, uh, with the idea and, and to introduce uh, a new country by country uh, index that the FAO is going to be hosting uh, later on today. So some of you may be aware the Gistemp Land Ocean Temperature Index is a, an index uh, designed uh, primarily to uh, estimate how the global temperature uh, has been changing. And that analysis, uh, we started doing that in 1981 um, uh, and uh, right now uses around 7,000 uh, land weather stations um, with the homogenization from the GHCN uh, effort at NOAA. Uh, with the addition of uh, the SCAR Antarctic data and with an urban bias correction to deal with uh, urban uh, issues, particularly in crowded areas like the United States. Uh, we use ocean temperatures from the ERSST5 product and uh, all changes are calculated with respect to a baseline of 1951 to 1980. Uh, so this is an anomaly index, uh, so the changes from that baseline period. Uh, we update this uh, monthly um, and the code and, and data is all publicly available at the GIST temp uh, website that you can see there. Um, the last month that we have, uh, while at every monthly uh, stage there's a lot of weather variability, for instance you can see the, the large contrast in the United States uh, in, in August uh, from one side to the other. Uh, the overall patterns, uh, particularly on the annual and the trend basis, are much clearer. If you uh, put together the annual index, uh, you get this uh, story going back uh, to about 1880 um, with uh, a pretty steady rise throughout the century, a bit of a pause in the 1940s to 1970 period. Um, and as you'll note, the last two years, 2015 and 2016, uh, were the warmest years on record. As the uh, processing and the data sources have changed uh, over time, uh, so has the estimate of the global mean temperature change. Um, and, uh, and as you can see, the, uh, the index that we started with uh, you know, back in 1987 uh, through to uh, 2017, uh, there is some structural uncertainty, particularly uh, around World War II and immediately preceding that. And obviously the further back you go into the 19th century, the more variance there is and the more structural uncertainty there is. Uh, but the trends but the trends that you see, uh, particularly from about 1970 onwards, are extremely robust in all versions. Um, and that's not just true with respect to uh, the versions that uh, GIS has put together, but also uh, with estimates that have been put together by other groups. Uh, and here we, I show you the, the work that's done by the uh, Hadley Center and Climate Research Unit in in the UK um, and the NOAA National Center for Environmental Information in the US and then two independent efforts uh, Berkeley Earth and Couchen and Way uh, which try and deal uh, independently with issues of homogenization and interpolation in data poor areas. All of these trends are as you can see uh, very well matched. Uh, there's also one line on here which is the uh, result that you get uh, if you make no corrections to the raw data for any non-climatic inhomogeneities and actually that has a larger trend over the 20th century uh, than the products that are being uh, put together by the groups that are taking that into account. Uh, you can see this is about a one degree change uh, over the 20th century um, and, the, and that's uh, roughly the amount of attributable warming uh, that we have uh, over that period. Um, I find actually that uh, people don't really get what a one degree change uh, really means uh, so I think it's often a little bit more interesting to put it in the context of an ice age unit and uh, we've gone up about a quarter of an ice age unit uh, one ice age unit is the temperature before the pre-industrial that the last ice age maximum was about 20,000 years ago. That was about four or five degrees 
colder than the pre-industrial and we've gone up one degree so that's about a quarter of an ice age unit that seems to be a slightly better uh, unit of measure uh, for the context of uh, the global temperature change uh, we can of course look at these results in a spatial context uh, and then we can compare them with uh, model results for what's going on um, as you can see here the uh, the models and the observations don't uh, don't match up uh, in the early part most of the the variation there you're seeing is is unpredictable weather uh, but as we are starting to get towards the end of the 20th century uh, one starts to see the global warming pattern emerge uh, both in the observations and in the models and so this is a hindcast and so you can see that the models and the observations share the same fingerprint uh, of change uh, particularly the warming over land uh, more than the ocean, the warming in the north more than the warming in the south, and the warming in the Arctic most of all. Um, we can also of course use these models and these data sets to uh, attempt an attribution of uh, what's been going on and this is a, a, a this is a product that we put together with uh, Bloomberg News. Uh, we can take all of the natural forcings, uh, changes in the orbit, changes in the sun, changes in volcanoes and we can match them up uh, and their expected fingerprint with the observed change. Um, particularly if you put together all of the natural changes together what you see is that there's a large mismatch between the observations and the, the model predictions. Uh, so if you include the uh, uh, human contributions, uh, land use change, uh, ozone pollution, ozone depletion in the stratosphere, uh, aerosols, air pollution, uh, and of course the increases in greenhouse gases, uh, what we find is that it is in fact the increase in greenhouse gases that is dominating the warming that you have observed over the 20th century. And in fact the net uh, result of all of the uh, human factors uh, matches the long-term trends extremely well and when you include of course the natural and the uh, anthropogenic forcings you get an extremely good match to the observed trends. So this gives us some confidence that we can explain how the changes have happened um, and why they're happening and therefore uh, what is likely to continue in the future. Um, now I'd like to introduce the uh, the new FAO stat uh, temperature change domain. Uh, people will be talking about this, I think, a little bit later. Uh, so we're working with uh, Dr. Tubiello and, and his team, uh, what we have done is we've taken that global data set, uh, which uses uh, information from, from a region to calculate the, uh, the changes uh, in any one particular place, and we've broken it down by country uh, so that we can get uh, both country and political region specific maps and time series uh, in interactively um, as a function of time and that uh, that data will be updated uh, annually if you put it on a kind of normalized basis so you're looking here at the uh, the standard deviations from that normal period in uh, uh, in 1951 to 1980 uh, you can see that uh, you know in most areas you don't see three standard deviation uh, anomalies very often uh, particularly in the earlier part of the, the 20th century. Uh, but as you get towards the end of the 20th century, uh, what you're seeing are, I mean, statistically very unlikely, but, uh, but physically very plausible, uh, three standard deviation departures. Uh, and particularly in 2016, which was the warmest year on record, we're seeing uh, three standard deviation departures from the norm uh, on, on, a, on a pretty widespread basis. Uh, 2017 won't be quite as warm as this, uh, it will probably be the second warmest year on record, uh, but uh, this data set uh, will allow people to go into their regions and their countries uh, to see uh, exactly how things are going um, based on this global uh, estimate of what's going on. Um, this is a uh, conference on uh, climate change statistics for, uh, for, for, for many uh, different purposes and uh, perhaps I might share with you a couple of lessons learnt uh, that we have uh, appreciated over the years of providing uh, climate change data uh, from, from NASA. Uh, climate change data is, is politicized particularly in the United States and, uh, and around uh, some other parts of the world and so there are some uh, important things that one needs to learn. 
Uh, the first thing is that you can build trust in your products, uh, but it can be easily lost uh, via missteps or uh, a lack of transparency in, in, in what's happening. Uh, we have provided access to the raw data and the processing code uh, since 2007 um, and that has been enormously helpful at uh, diffusing some of the, uh, the, the misplaced attention to the processing uh, that, that has occurred. Um, when we see a change in processing, whether it's a bug fix or a, or a decision to deal with uh, some, uh, some other change, uh, or we have a change in the data input, uh, we always document those changes and those impacts of those changes are shown uh, for you know, the current year and the current months. Uh, that's very important because there are always changes um, and there are always errors that are fixed. Uh, and if they happen without documentation or without notification, uh, people will take the wrong idea. Uh, we do provide a uh, frequently asked questions for the most common things that people ask us. Uh, and some of those are uh, range from uh, very basic uh, questions like why we use anomalies instead of absolute temperatures uh, to quite subtle issues uh, related to the trends in uh, the US temperatures uh, since the 1990s. Um, we do provide a history page which which shows the long-term evolution of these uh, changes and of the data set itself, uh, demonstrating that the f practical uh, import of the, of the data, the long-term trends, uh, are in fact robust to all of these changes, and that's very important. Um, when we do discover errors or when this errors have been notified to us, uh, we try and have a very, very rapid response with acknowledgement to whoever uh, notified us of those, those errors. And, uh, and that's, been, uh, that's been very important so that errors don't persist and, and, uh, and stay and, and reduce trust in our products. Uh, but of course, uh, some people will still get things wrong because people just sometimes just don't want to hear the information that you're producing um, and there's uh, there's very little one can do uh, about that the most important lesson of course is that you know we're showing uh, information that is important and has widespread implications for for future climate changes but also future policy changes and while we do make uh, predictions, uh, both in the short term and in the long term, using uh, climate models, uh, the most important thing, I think, for us is, is, is the realization that, that it is not enough to just sit and watch scientific predictions come true. Uh, this data is not just data for the sake of it. Uh, this is data that is fundamental to how we are going to react as a society to large global scale problems. And so uh, I think that the effort that is being undertaken here at this meeting and, uh, and around the world uh, has never been more important. And I wish you all the luck with that. Thank you very much.